Good evening and welcome to our service of evening prayer from the Book of Common Prayer. Uh, you are warmly welcomed here this evening. As we begin, we acknowledge, as we always do, but we hope it doesn't just become something that we do by rote, but we acknowledge that we are on the lands of the Kwangan people, now known by the Song, as the Songhees and Esquimalt nations, colonial names given to them. And we recognize that, one, to acknowledge with gratitude their stewardship of this place as a place of nourishment and nurture, formerly orchards and growing places for those nations. But we also make that acknowledgement because we recognize our need to decolonize ourselves and in partnership with the indigenous peoples of this place to learn how to tell the truth, uh, how to listen, and how to grow together, we hope, with healing and a new relationship. You are welcomed at this ancient service uh, and, and yet always fresh with help from our choristers and musicians. An opportunity for us to bathe in uh, both the history and the now of our faith and, dare I say, to lead us to a place we hope of transcendence, uh, a place of growth and openness to the divine. So let us open our hearts and minds in prayer.
first lesson is taken from the book of Daniel. King Belshazzar made a great festival for a thousand of his lords, and he was drinking wine in the presence of the thousand. Under the influence of the wine, Belshazzar commanded that they bring in the vessels of gold and silver that his father, Nebuchadnezzar, had taken out of the temple in Jerusalem, so that the king and his lords, his wives, and his concubines might drink from them. So they brought in the vessels of gold and silver that had been taken out of the temple, the house of God in Jerusalem, and the king and his lords, his wives, and his concubines drank from them. They drank the wine and praised the gods of gold and silver, bronze, iron, wood, and stone. Immediately, the fingers of a human hand appeared and began writing on the plaster of the wall of the royal palace next to the lampstand. The king was watching the hand as it wrote. Then the king's face turned pale, and his thoughts terrified him. His limbs gave way, and his knees knocked together. The king cried aloud to bring in the enchanters, the Chaldeans, and the diviners. And the king said to the wise men of Babylon, whoever can read this writing and tell me its interpretation, shall be clothed in purple, have a chain of gold around his neck, and rank third in the kingdom. Then all the king's wise men came, but they could not read the writing or tell the king the interpretation. Then King Belshazzar became greatly terrified, and his face turned pale, and his lords were perplexed. The queen when she heard the discussion of the king and his lords, came into the banqueting hall. The queen said, O king, live forever. Do not let your thoughts terrify you or your face grow pale. There is a man in your kingdom who is endowed with the spirit of the holy gods. In the days of your father, he was found to have enlightenment understanding and wisdom like the wisdom of the gods. Your father, King Nebuchadnezzar, made him chief of the magicians, enchanters, Chaldeans, and diviners because an excellent spirit, knowledge, and understanding to interpret dreams, explain riddles, and solve problems were found in this Daniel, who the king named Belteshazzar. Now let Daniel be called, and he will give you the interpretation. Then Daniel was brought in before the king. The king said to Daniel, So you are Daniel, one of the exiles of Judah, whom my father and the, the king brought from Judah. I have heard of you that a spirit of the gods is in you, and that enlightenment, understanding, and excellent wisdom are found in you. Now the wise men, the enchanters, have been brought in before me to read this writing and to tell me its interpretation, but they were not able to give the interpretation of the matter. But I have heard that you can give interpretations and solve problems. Now if you are able to read the writing and to tell me its interpretation, you shall be clothed in purple, have a chain of gold around your neck, and rank third in the kingdom. Then Daniel answered in the presence of the king, Let your gifts be for yourself, or give your rewards to someone else. Nevertheless, I will read the writing to the king, and let him know the interpretations. O king, the most high God gave your father, Nebuchadnezzar, <coughs> kingship, greatness, glory, and majesty. And because of the greatness that he gave him, all peoples, nations, and languages trembled and feared before him. He killed those he wanted to kill, kept alive those he wanted to keep alive, 
honored those he wanted to honor and degraded those he wanted to degrade. But when his heart was lifted up and his spirit was hardened so that he acted proudly, he was deposed from his kingly throne and his glory was stripped from him. He was driven from human society and his mind was make like, made like that of an animal. His dwelling was with the wild asses. He was fed grass like oxen and his body was bathed with the dew of heaven until he learned that the Most High God has sovereignty over the kingdom of mortals and sets over it whomsoever he will. And you, Belshazzar, his son, have not humbled your heart, even though you knew all this. You have exalted yourself against the Lord of heaven. The vessels of his temple have been brought in before you, and you and your lords, your wives, and your concubines have been drinking wine from them. You have praised the gods of silver and gold, of bronze, iron, wood, and stone, which do not see or hear or know, but the God in whose power is your very breath, and to whom belong all your ways, you have not honored. So from his presence the hand was sent, and this writing was inscribed. And this is the writing that was inscribed, Mene, Mene, Tekel, and Parsin. This is the interpretation of the matter. Mene, God has numbered the days of your kingdom and brought it to an end. Tekel, you have been weighed in the balance and found wanting. Perez, your kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and Persians. Then Belshazzar gave the command, and Daniel was clothed in purple, a chain of gold was put around his neck, and a proclamation was made concerning him that he should rank third in the kingdom. That very night, Belshazzar, the Chaldean king, was killed. And Darius the Mede received the kingdom, being about 62 years old. Here ends the lesson.
The second lesson is from the Gospel of John. After this, Jesus went to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, also called the Sea of Tiberias. A large crowd kept following him because they saw the signs that he was doing for the sick. Jesus went up the mountain and sat down there with his disciples. Now the Passover, the festival of the Jews, was near. When he looked up and saw a large crowd coming towards him, Jesus said to Philip, where are we to buy bread for these people to eat? He said this to test him, for he himself knew what he was going to do. Philip answered him, six months' wages would not buy enough bread for each of them to get a little. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, there is a boy here who has five barley loaves and two fish. What are they among so many people? Jesus said, make the people sit down. Now there was a great deal of grass in the place. So they sat down, about 5,000 in all. Then Jesus took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed them to those who were seated. So also the fragments left over. Sorry, so also the fish, as much as they wanted. When they were satisfied, he told his disciples, gather up the fragments left over so that nothing may be lost. So they gathered them up, and from the fragments of the five barley loaves left by those who had eaten, they filled twelve baskets. When the people saw the sign that he had done, they began to say, this is indeed the prophet who is to come into the world. When Jesus realized that they were about to come and take him by force to make him king, he withdrew again to the mountain by himself. Here ends the second lesson.
I believe in God, the Father Almighty,
Let us pray. As we begin our prayers for the world and for the church, we remember that yesterday was the transgender day of remembrance. The day when we celebrate the diversity of God's creation, but we mourn the loss of those who through violence or through the trauma they endured have lost their lives. We remember those who are transgendered and non-gender conforming. God of liberation, lift up we pray all our trans and non-binary and agendered siblings who have gone before us. People on whose path breaking shoulders we stand. Be with us as we mourn these your beloved lost to violence and suicide this year. Bind us together in beloved community and strengthen us for the ongoing work of eradicating the intersecting evils of transphobia trans misogyny, racism, sexism, and classism. May light perpetual shine upon those we have lost. May their names be for a blessing. And may we be inspired and energized to join in co-creating a world in which the dignity of all our humanity and of all creation is safeguarded and honored. In your holy name we pray. Amen. In this time of pandemic, as the world continues to be anxious and fearful, we pray for peace. We pray for those who are seeking to guide us through pandemic. Those who are treating the sick. Those who are on the front lines. First responders. Personnel in medical facilities and long-term care. Those who continue to provide the goods and services that we need. We pray for us all and the fatigue and anxiety we carry. O gracious God, the refuge of all them that put their trust in thee, we turn to thee in this time of trouble. Direct the course of this world, we humbly beseech thee in accordance with thy holy will. Take away whatever hinders the nations from unity and concord. And prosper all counsels which make for righteousness and peace. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. We pray for our province and those suffering from the destruction and the power of nature in these past weeks. We pray for those seeking to rebuild, those seeking to restore, those continuing to seek to rescue and to care.
pray that we may grow in our respect and nurture of God's creation. Almighty and everlasting God, in giving us stewardship over things on earth, you made us fellow workers in your creation. Give us wisdom and reference, so to use and to care for the resources of nature that none may suffer from our abuse of them. That generations yet to come may continue to praise you for your bounty. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And we remember in prayer all those known to us who are sick or struggling. Those who are in any kind of need. We pray also for those who have none to pray for them. Those known to God alone. O merciful God, who has taught us in thy holy word that thou dost not willingly afflict or grieve thy children, look with pity upon the sorrows of thy servants for whom our prayers are offered. Remember them, O Lord, in mercy, nourish their souls with patience, comfort them with a sense of thy goodness, lift up thy countenance upon them, and give them peace. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And for ourselves we pray that we may be people of grace and compassion, meeting the troubles of this world with love, with faith, and with hope. Direct us, O Lord, in all our doings with thy most gracious favor, and further us with thy continual help that in all our works, begun, continued, and ended in thee, we may glorify thy holy name, and finally by thy mercy obtain everlasting life, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.
eat it. Well, that was quite a, uh, a long reading we had there from Daniel, and within it, what? Chutzpah from Daniel himself. Walking into Belshazzar's feast and letting the king know in no uncertain terms, and this is a paraphrase from the original Hebrew, he is toast. Your days have been numbered, he says. You have been weighed in the balance and found wanting. Your kingdom will fall and be divided. Hard words, difficult to hear and difficult to say. Of course, the book of Daniel is a book of fables in many ways, apocalyptic visions, all hanging together around this character of Daniel, a mythic character, one of the exiles in Babylon. It is a collection of writings that dates from the seventh, second century BCE, but is referring to events of the sixth century BCE. And the core message seems to be that just as Daniel is repeatedly saved from his enemies, so will Israel be saved from those who afflict and oppress them, empire after empire after empire. A philosophy eloquently summed up, perhaps, by Sonny Kapoor, manager of the best exotic Marigold Hotel. It will be all right in the end, and if it's not all right, it's not the end. Thank you to Michael King for giving me that proper quote, because I got it wrong when I tried to say it to him. And to the internet for letting me know that the author of that is actually unknown, but it was made popular originally by John Lennon. So here we have repeatedly in this, this theme of God's salvific will and the restoration of Israel's fortunes, both in the parallels to Daniel's experience and that of other faithful Jews, such as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and in the visions that then follow on from chapter 7. And with the fabulous nature of these stories, we still have this core value that is given to those who hear the stories. Remain faithful. No matter what the surroundings, remember to speak the truth no matter what the danger. And that is Daniel's role in this feast, to speak the truth, to point out the king's folly and God's retribution for the misuse of the temple vessels and the haughtiness of the king, to speak truth to power. And on this reign of Christ Sunday that crowns the liturgical year, so next week we can start saying Happy New Year to each other, we are reminded that this is the calling of the church, to speak truth and to speak out against all that oppresses, to oppose the religion of empire and promote the love-filled, justice-bringing reign of God. As I said before, I believe that reign rather than kingdom is a helpful corrective to either the idea that God is like a king, like any human king, namely male and patriarchal, and that somehow that this kingdom is a place rather than a way of being. The reign is a grace-filled, healing-bringing state lived by those who are filled with God's gracious spirit of love. But there is a hard truth that we as the church need to hear. And indeed that we as the church need to speak to one another. That we as an institution have been weighed in the balance and found wanting. That we may see our days numbered, particularly in the form that we're in now. And that division, more often by choice and inability to live graciously with one another, may be our all too often frequent destiny. We have, we must confess, lived into being the religion of empire, defiling our sacred vessels by feasting at the table of colonialism, capitalism, and the love of power over the calling to service. 
In our gospel reading this evening, we have another story of mythic proportions. We have an example of the young person who gives everything to serve the needs of the many. My high school, I was sharing this with Karen earlier, my high school religious studies teacher, because we still have religious studies in England, said that he believed the young boy's actions in giving the loaves and fishes for all was enough to shame everyone into bringing out their own brown bag lunch and handing them around. And that the real miracle of that story was the transformation of hearts, not a, a, an amazing abundance of miraculous provision. Whatever the offshoot, the basis of that story, it is one indeed that reflects transformation and that shows the provision possible by God's grace when we give of ourselves to one another. It is indeed a story that invites us to transformation, to looking to one another over dedication to institution, power, control, or influence, no matter how benignly the church may think its influence was. The colonial structures and unquestioned racism and belief in white European cultural superiority have only shown how easy it is for the church to collude in oppression and genocide, actual and cultural genocide. So indeed, we need to hear that the church has been found wanting and continue to be as we seek to unravel our ties to and deep acceptance of colonialism and patriarchy, recognizing that in life and death, Jesus challenged the religion of empire and was ultimately killed by empire, but that Christ defies those powers in the triumph of the resurrection, refusing to allow death the final word. The opportunity the church has and this reign of Christ Sunday shows us or reminds us of is to put the subversive worldview challenging Christ at the heart of what we do, how we do it, and why we do it. As the institution that is the church, again, is called to faithfulness, to living the values of healing, justice, grace, love, and affirmation. That Jesus has called us, his followers, to be those people. Whatever the fate of the church may be, may we learn to remain faithful as the people of Christ to those values which are at the heart of the reign of Christ. Amen.
peace of God which passeth all understanding keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of God's Son Jesus Christ our Lord and the blessing of God Almighty the Father the Son and the Holy Ghost be amongst you and those whom you love and remain with you always. <laughs>